Welcome back to the Change Your Filter podcast. I am your host, Tall Paul. We are powered by Contractor Commerce, of course, where we see a future where every contractor has an online store. Today's guest is Tom Tao. Tom Tao is the Vice President of Sales at Service First Financial. I have known Tom for about 15 years. Um, what I admire about Tom is he's always working on the hard project and trying to drive change. He's always trying to push the boulder up the hill. Uh, that is no exception to what he is doing at Service First Financial. I have been, I guess to say, the, at least interested, but honestly, a little obsessed with this idea that the buying process for homeowners and contractors today is inefficient and absurd. Um, there's got to be an easier and a better way to do it. There's got to be a middle ground. Service First Financial um, is a leasing company that works, with, I guess you could call them a leasing company. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll let Tom describe that, um, but works with contractors every day to uh, help contractors use the Premier program to have higher tickets and close more jobs. What do I mean by that? This concept of consumer leasing for HVAC, will it scale like it dominates in Canada? The idea of a low monthly payment or worry-free comfort, as they call it, it works really well for our friends up north. Um, and really well in pockets of the United States, there's a huge contractor that does this really, really well in Atlanta. But is this going to be a viable way or on par with traditional purchasing practices of consumers in HVAC today? Honestly, I don't know, but I know this. Service First is backed by some serious names and some serious leadership. And as I like to say, these people ain't playing around. They're making a huge bet that this is the future of HVAC and home services here in the U.S., Please enjoy this conversation with my good friend, Tom Tao. Do you remember the early days of Service Roundtable or Service Nation, all of that? Yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, it, it was, um, you know, there were some people that had been involved in Linux at it. So, you know, we yeah. kind of would hear some feedback and see it. And, it, you know, it was really, there was, there was never this place where contractors could go get resources, good yeah. coaching, good help inexpensively the the you know the monthly memberships and so it was like we were cheering them on you know hoping that that would would succeed because it was really something that was needed um you know going back to my early days at lennox we were trying to do marketing consulting with contractors only to find out that they weren't making enough money in their business to be able to afford marketing so what we really needed to do was go back and you know that basic boot camp type stuff that right. You know, now there's kind of a lot of companies out there doing that, but they were certainly on the forefront of that. Yeah. Yeah. I heard, I've heard stories about like the first pitch meetings where they looked for investors. And I think Lou Hobica, I forget, don't quote me on this, but something like invested 25 grand and then waited, I don't know, 18 or 20 years and got a really good return on that. So yeah, no, yeah. He, I know he was one of the, uh, one of the early guys involved and invested and yeah, you know, I I knew Matt Michelle a little bit back then. Uh, we never really connected a lot after he was, you know, kind of more engaged in running things there. But you know, you just watch it from afar and know that yeah. you know if contractors figured out how to go in, engage, and get the stuff they needed, they were going to help a lot of people. And it's interesting because as that one has you know since churned, not churned, it's turned over to, to private equity. It still continues to grow. There's like CEO Warrior who's changed figureheads turned over to private equity, still continues to grow. I see people that have been going to those events for years and years and years. I just think there's a long shelf life and I think there's there are good investments and there are good groups to be involved in. I see some new ones coming about. Have you heard of the the home service ooh, freedom maybe? Is that Tommy Mello and the garage door stuff? That's not one I'm familiar with yet. Yeah, the most recent one we've, we've become engaged with is the, the Blue Collar Success Group. Okay. Yeah. Another group. Uh, they, they've yeah. got a lot of energy. We had went to a meeting of theirs about a month ago out in Phoenix. And, um, you know, it's a smaller group at just yep. getting their feet, you know, on the ground and really great quality stuff. Um, yeah, I think they're going to do well. So let's think about this for a moment. And then we have so much to get into, but it's good. And I have just random questions for you to catch up because it's been a while. But yep. when you think about like years ago, pre, not necessarily pre internet, but contractors used to evaluate things for their business that they would encounter on, you know, at trade shows and, you know, through best practice groups and those sort of things. Um, because of the internet now, has that changed or is that still like that is how you go to market if you're a, you know, like what you do or a software company or a CRM? Yeah. I, it's it's interesting, you know, because I watch my kids on the internet, and you know all the things that I can do around the house. I'd learned with my dad, 
you know, and I go work with my son-in-laws and it's like, uh, they, they, you know, they watched it on YouTube. Yeah. I don't think contractors use YouTube for that kind of stuff as much. I, yeah. I think the, the personal connection, I think that the depth of the information that they need, if they're trying to fix a problem in their business, th there's just, th they, they like to know who they're talking to. They like to have sort of this, a little bit of trust built up and feel good about the experience and where this is coming from that you don't always get off a of video on YouTube. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So, well, Hey, if we haven't talked in a while, I, I feel like we've done a, we've probably done two or three podcasts together, one or two at least couple, over the yeah. last couple of years. But, um, I want to pick up where we left off. What have you been up to? What's, what's exciting and what's new, what's going on in your world. And then I want to talk about what's going on in the, in the, uh, kind of comfort as a service place. Yeah, sure. So, um, gosh, what's on, on the personal side, you know, it's, it's great to be kind of back to normal in terms of, you know, all the interaction and things going on in the, in the world. And, you know, obviously Gail and I are, are empty nesters, but, uh, you know, we've got, uh, uh, one married daughter that lives down in San Antonio, another one that lives North of us about, uh, 30 minutes or so. And she's got a two year old granddaughter and a, a grandson on the way that's due in September. So, you know, we kind of try and stay connected there, but probably a bigger part of, you know, time is just, you know, that transition with your parents. Yeah. Um, you know, a year ago in May, you know, my dad was 96 and, and, and passed away. His body had just kind of given up, had a great life, actually lived at home the whole time. Uh, but so mom had, you know, some, some health challenges that were uh, vision issues and some other things security wise. So, so we moved her into assisted living. She's near one of my brothers, but it, you know, just a challenge to stay connected to her, keep her going. It's, it's been a great experience for her, but you know, we've been consumed. We're still trying to sell the house, you know, cleaning things out. They lived there since 1977. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the time is consumed with all those, you know, those family things. I'm, I'm not really a golfer. I've never, um, you know, been into that. So, you know, I kind of stay as busy as can be doing all those things. Nothing really prepares you for the different phase shifts that you go through, you know, oh, like, you no. know, it's coming, you hear people talk about it. And then when you're dealing with it, you're like, it feels like you're the first person on the planet who's had to go through it and you have to navigate yeah. it alone. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if morbid's the right word, but I, uh, maybe it's sobering, but I was talking to Will about this recently. Um, there, someone, I was sitting through a seminar and they, um, shared this perspective about, um, spending time with your parents as they get older. And they shared like this really quick, simple formula that I can't remember. And it doesn't matter because it still tells the same story that you can pretty much do the math on how many times you're going to see your parents before they pass away based on like how many times a year do you see them now? How, how often do you see them? How much time do you spend? And it is a terrifyingly sad, sad, small number. And yeah. um, it just makes you, I'm kind of going through it now. My mom's not listening to this, but I'm trying to do that now to prioritize like, gosh, man, I I want my kids to spend more time with me when I'm older. I make them promise that, but yeah. Um, another, another kind of along those lines, um, we're completely off topic here, but that's okay. Cause it's my, my podcast, our conversation. Um, right. there's this, uh, plugin you can put on uh, Google Chrome that will calculate your age. And then you're based on, you know, actuary data or just a random number basically tells you how much time you have left to live. And it, um, is used to measure like wasted time. Like if you're scrolling on Facebook or whatever, it's like, Hey, you have 40,000 yeah. hours left in your life. Like, I don't know what that equates to. That doesn't sound like a lot, but Probably if not. this is, if this is how you want to use it, it's completely fine. But, um, anyhow, you can tell yeah. I've been doing a lot of introspective. It's because I just turned 40, Tom. Okay. Well, so, uh, this summer in another month, my daughter's turned 30. So yeah. that'll, you know, that, that'll do the same thing to you, but obviously you're still just a kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. No one prepares you for this either. I was just thinking about this today. I had a doctor's appointment yesterday and there's a point, you, no one tells you this, but like, there's a point in your life where the doctor walks in and they're significantly younger than you. And you're like, wait a minute. Like how, and in your mind, you're like, how could you possibly have enough wisdom? You know? Oh you, Yeah. <laughs> You know, especially when you go into some of those specialists, you know, at my age, you go to all the different specialists, oh, yeah. just, you know, like the, the, uh, the heart doctor. Yeah. It's like, 
he's a kid, you know, he's like, looks like he's 25, incredibly yeah. bright. You know, I feel good about him, but you're right. That, that first time you walk in and look at him, it's like, when's the doctor coming in? Such is life. It just happens. These are the things that, you know, we shouldn't be surprised about, but we are. Yeah. So, well, it's congratulations on being a, a grand, a grandfather. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Um, you know, she's at an age now at two where, you know, she's excited to see everybody and, you know, talking, she's been walking for a long time, but, um, um, you know, we don't, we, we feel like we don't get to see him enough, but, you know, I think as my daughter gets closer to September and she's more and more pregnant, I think we'll probably be helping him out more often. So uh, that's fun. Plus that, you know, we get him over here to get, get in the pool during the summer. So gives him another cute excuse to come by during the week. Good, good. Well, um, for the listeners, even though I, I I could spend a lot more time here, I will transition to start talking about work. That is feedback that I get from people that like the podcast and say we just get right down to it. So um, it's been a while. I'll just I'll just jump right in. That's but great. Yeah. I think in, in 2020, you and I started talking about the concept of leasing and we weren't necessarily calling it leasing at the time. Um, I know that that that's another conversation I want to talk about. Um, but I, I want to hear what's going on at work. What's it been like the last couple of years? And I have a bunch of specific questions about what's going on in the market. Sure. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a, it's an exciting, busy time here right now. We've, you know, I don't know if you follow us and I'll see us on, on LinkedIn once in a while. We're, we're trying to hire three or four different people right now. Um, we, you know, we've brought some, some pretty exciting new big customers on in the last, you know, six or eight weeks, mm -hmm. um, that are doing really well. Um, some of them had, leadership that came from companies that had already had experience with that. And that always helps. Um, but I, it, you know, it just, you kind of step back to 2020. And when we first started on this, we rolled this all out. Perfect timing, best business plan ever, March of 2020. Mm -hmm. You take your product to the street at the time, everybody's locking the country down. So it, it feels like we've been, you know, kind of pushing this rock uphill yep. and it, you know, just in the last probably, Oh, since the fourth quarter of last year, it felt like we kind of got on a, a much lower slope or we may have actually got to the top and we're, you know, we've got a little momentum and, you know, some, some turning points in some different areas that, you know, it's, it's now it's like, okay, we're going to have enough people in six months to, to, to keep up with it because it, it, it is yeah. doing very well. And, and that was, you know, a big part of that early on was the education process and how many people were having a conversation like you and I just kind of even, you know, after I started working here three years ago, understanding what the program was, understanding how it benefited a customer, understanding the, you know, kind of that dynamics and how customers saw subscription or enrolling in something and not actually purchasing something differently. Um, and and that the fact that we, you know, we really, it is legally a lease, but we don't use that term because for a lot of people, there's a negative connotation that goes back to the old kind of actually the old rental weekly rental days when people would come out and repo stuff. And, yeah. you know, that's not mm. what this is at all. These are people who can afford to buy things, but are doing this for the convenience of it for themselves and their family. And it just, you know, f set it and forget it, right. Mm -hmm. Set it up on the monthly payment plan. If you have a problem, you pick up the phone, somebody comes and fixes it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always been on my mind. The, um, the word lease and, and it, please correct me if it's unfair that I referred to it at least before I referred to it as a, as a subscription, because I've always thought that one of the, not the drawbacks, but one of the headwinds that we have, we have in the U S to getting something like this working is this idea that leasing is already a category that exists in people's minds and it's already got connotations. And, um, I find it interesting. Like, how do you, do you break through that or do you create a separate category or or um, how do you reframe the homeowner's mind and make the contractor feel comfortable with that? You know, and that's a big piece of, of the training that, uh, you know, that John Carmen and our sales coaches do is first they've got to get the comfort advisor to think of it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, leasing doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation. What's the percentage of people out there that are driving cars around right now that have them under lease? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Somewhere around 40%. So, you know, it's, it's not a, a bad thing per se. It just depends upon, you know, what kind of memories they have. Right. What we really try to do, and I think what's important for contractors and homeowners to understand is think about the things today that you maybe used to buy that you're not any longer buying 
that you're either subscribing to or you have a license. You know, that's the the software industry. It's a license. No, it's not a subscription. You know, my I, yeah. my Microsoft Outlook, I have to pay for it once a year. Well, that's a subscription. It's just an annual subscription. It's not monthly. But when you go into a home and you start to have the homeowner list the things that they have on subscription, the streaming services, a lot of them have some type of fitness program. Um, you know, they've got 8, 10, 12 different prescriptions. So they're buying these things already. The idea is just understanding that, oh, I can get my home comfort system that way. I can get my water heater that way. I can get my standby generator that way. I didn't know that. I hadn't thought of it before. You know, if they hadn't been in Canada and been exposed to it prior to, you know, 2016 or 17, when it kind of came to the U.S., it's just brand new to them. It's not that yeah. they don't like it. It's that nah, it's, it's the first time around. I don't know, know that I understand it. And just how prevalent is it in Canada? Well, most of the numbers we always heard early on were for that kind of the eastern half of the state that talked about as many as 80% of water heaters up there are on some type of lease or rental model. Um, and the HVAC is somewhere between 40 and 50%. It's unbelievable. And it's been and, going on for, you know, for 25 plus years for the right. work got started. That's incredible. And, and so like everyone agrees that the model makes sense. What are some of the headwinds you have? I mean, I know what some of them are. Is it just training and reframing? Like what, what, um, what are the limitations? Yeah, it, it, it really comes down to the, the preconceived notions mm -hmm. that everybody has. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's whether it's, uh, I would never do that or, you know, so I'm not going to offer it to my customer. Um, you, you know, and there are people out there who don't, don't even finance anything. They only buy mm -hmm. stuff they can pay for. Um, and that's okay. We, that's what we teach everybody. There's a percentage of the market that will do this if it's presented to them. And that, that's kind of the piece you have to show them. Um, I think we've, we've removed some of the obstacles over the last probably 18 months that used to be out there. Um, one of them used to be, you mean at the end of 10 years, I don't own the equipment? Well, no, you can buy it if you want. There's a residual value, but why would you want to buy a 10-year-old piece of equipment the warranty just expired on? Right. right? Well, yeah. we have a loyalty program now. They can earn money. The homeowner earns money. And there's money in their account, uh, worry-free money, whatever we call it, that they can use. Maybe they use it to buy a water heater, or they may be use it to buy that unit if they want. Or better yet, it's a you know like one of those loyalty incentives on a car. When you buy the same brand again, you use that money for part of a down payment to lower the price of your next system 10, 12 years from now. Right. So that used to be a big piece was, you know, I get hung up on why should I have to pay for it at the end of 10 years I've been paying for it. So, well, that's the lease, the way the lease is designed. But the way the program is designed is it's it's really not for the homeowner who ever wants to own the equipment, mm -hmm. right? If, if they want to own the equipment, we tell the customer advisor, comfort advisor, just sell it to them. Provide your normal financing or cash package and sell it to them because they're not going to be happy at some point. They're going to be wanting to buy it. Just don't get into that battle. Find the customer the solution that fits for them. You know, what's the yeah. best solution for your family? Okay, let's go there. It's so interesting. Like that is a bold thing to, you know, try to train on is, talk, you know, talking to homeowners about, or talking to someone who's selling about, find out if they really want to own the equipment. That's a conversation. Of course they do that. Everybody wants to own the equipment. That's, there's no other option. So you're having to really like divide there. Um, but so right, once they know that they don't have to own it. Yeah. Well, it's, no, I don't, I don't want to own it. You mean you'll take care of it, put it in out here? And I, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's one of the pieces that comes in. Um, you know, one of the contractor obstacles, not so much a homeowner obstacles, initially was they didn't feel like they were getting, you know, enough for their reimbursements. Uh, they were getting coverage, enough coverage. And so we've modified that along the way. We actually give the contractor choices now without going into all the details. Yeah. They can do one or two maintenance calls a year, and they can they can choose the amount that they are reimbursed within a, a bandwidth from us, yeah. and and we typically try and get them to tie it to what you know what do you charge for a maintenance agreement? Okay, well, yeah. so what's the appropriate amount for what's here, and and that again has helped move people forward. It's like when they feel like they're not being told this is the one amount and this is what we're paid, whether you're in New York where it's really expensive or Southern Louisiana where it's really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's the flexibility built in so we can, you know, deal with different size markets and, and each customer, each contractor feels like they're getting a good deal. And what are the options at the 10 year point for the homeowner? Yeah. So at the end of 10 years, there's four options. And if you look at the way that they're going to normally be taken, the highest percentage of people are, are going to renew or just extend as long as that equipment's working well, they On can the do that just a month yep. at a time for up to three years. So they can go from 10 to, to 13 years. The second option um, is that they can say, hey, you know, what's this is here's the new 25, 35, 40 SEER equipment. I want you to put that in and they mm-hmm. can upgrade and, you know, kind of like people upgrade their phones before it's really stopped working, but there's new technology. It's better, faster, smarter, whatever that, you know, it's, it's more efficient. It's quieter. It, it's smart controls does all those. I can manage it from my phone, those kind of things. Um, so then the third option is they can buy it. But again, very few people are going to buy it when it's, you know, just gone out of warranty, um, but they can. And then the fourth option, because legally it is a lease, they can say, okay, we're going to just turn this in and do something else. Mm-hmm. And so we'll notify, you know, they're going to talk to the contractor that installed it. So they'll have a chance to sell them something else, but whatever they choose, we just notify the contractor to take it out and dispose of it at the end of the lease. How reasonable, I guess it's, we can't really project 10 years out, but I'm thinking like, okay, am I going from, if I have, you know, if I, if I go through the 10 years at $130 a month, how reasonable is it that I'll be able to get better or good enough technology in 10 years? That's 140 a month. Is that, are you seeing? Yeah. So the, yeah, no, great question. So there's a couple of things that'll impact that. Now we do have a, a an inflation factor built into the payment. The payment goes yep. up about 3% a, month, a, a year. Okay. Yep. And so it, you know, at the end of that time, the payment's going to be more than what it was when you started. Of mm-hmm. course, normally over that same amount of time, people are getting promotions, they're making more money. It's, um, but at the, at, at the same time, when they reach that point, they've got the worry-free rewards that they've been earning. Yeah. And so they're able to make that down payment, put that in uh, line with the fact that there's been, you know, maybe hopefully inflation doesn't stay at the rate that it is, you know, previous 35 years was, was pretty steady. Uh, but those two things should contribute to have them be fairly close to whatever their final payment was on the last piece of equipment yeah. they, they turned in. And if you're a contractor listening to this, and again, not to break it down to the, the bare bones here, but I think it's important. Like what's the big, big win and why for the contractor and why are, I I know you have a lot of customers now, why are contractors switching from traditional, traditional financing to including this as an option? Yeah. I I, I think the three biggest things, um, number one is, um, an an increase in their average ticket and margin. And, And we've seen this on our portfolio and it's held true for three years. Um, it, it's around 30%. And people challenge that and say, well, normally what we see, because the program is only presented with a monthly payment because it's a lease. It's not like financing. You don't have to put that big dollar amount up there. So they're buying more, better, and best Yep. because it's just that monthly payment, right? Yep. The other thing is the attach rate on IQ products. If you look at filtered, uh, um, pleated filters, four and five inch or electrostatic one inch, we're attaching more than 65% of all the systems that are turned in or that are sold on our program have one of those on them. Yep. And then over 35% have got a whole home IQ product of some type. Mm-hmm. Now, going back two years, that number was even higher because of the pandemic. But still, 35, you know, if you remember back to our OEM days, that's way above what the averages are. Oh. So those things make that ticket price, and, the, and because you're selling higher you know, the higher end equipment, the margin dollars go up with that revenue dollars. So that's a big piece. And then it's an agreement that's locked into the installing contractor. So they've got at the minimum, a 10 year maintenance commitment uh, up to 13 years and there's no attrition. So they've got a hundred percent retention. They don't have to do marketing and advertising to those people because they can only use that contractor to work on that equipment. The third piece of that is and, and they have recurring revenue, mm-hmm. depending on the ticket price, somewhere in the four to $6,000 range over that 10 years for going out and doing maintenance and, and what they earn for, uh, for coverage of, of emergency repairs. And they're so still funded up front. Yeah, really big average ticket, locked in service. It's a potentially a customer for life if you renew them at the end of 10 years, and then you've got that guaranteed recurring revenue. 
Yeah. And if you put all those into a, you know, if a homeowner or if a, if a, a business is looking to ultimately sell that biz, that business later on, it's adding value. It's going to take. It's, those are exactly the things that these private equity companies are looking for when they evaluate that business to see how financially strong and and independent independent they are, profitable, yeah. uh, to value that business higher. Well, I know the answer to this question, so we'll have to filter it a little bit. You know, my question is: Are you satisfied with like how the market is responding? Not necessarily to your product, but like the concept in general. Like, do you feel like it's? Um, you said pushing a rock uphill, and that's like the perfect description of how that this must feel. How's the market doing with this? From a, um, we'll start with the consumer, and then we'll we'll think about the contractor because there's two different things there. Yeah. Well, it, it, what's fascinating is the consumers are pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. When we get the commitment and the accountability from a contractor that our sales guys are going to present this option every time, yep. we're seeing them fairly quickly pick up you know, 10, 15, 20% of their volume being moved through this program. Yep. Where they've got some experience, we've got several centers that are even higher than that. So we know that homeowners, when it's presented well and explained, they're already buying this way in so many categories, they'll, they'll do it. Um, you know, the, the portfolio company that brought this down here from Canada when they were purchased by a Canadian company, as we understand it, they're doing about 60% of all of their replacement sales on their model. So. Yep. That's just test, and that's in big markets, small markets. That's over, you know, over a hundred different centers in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, so it's fairly consistent in terms of the acceptance from homeowners, as long as the contractors mm -hmm. put it in front. Right. Yeah, I think I think homeowners are going to take the path of least resistance and not always think ten years out. Like, yeah, they do that all the time. Same thing with leasing a vehicle, same thing with buying a vehicle. Like they know the the depreciation off the lot. There's all these things, but there are trade-offs, right? There's a great correlation to the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. As we've had price increases in this industry over the last 18, 24 months, there are a lot of markets where they've reached this sort of affordability, you know, threshold. Yeah. That the auto industry figured, you know, got there about 15 years ago, and that's when they introduced leasing. But in some markets, you know, that mm -hmm. financed cost, even on a monthly basis, is is really prohibitive. Being able to do this over the long term, 10 years, but also have all the other things that might be surprises covered for no extra charge, it, you know, that becomes very appealing to somebody that's looking at this saying, I'm going to keep my $20,000 for this system pay you on a monthly basis. I'll invest it over here. I won't have any surprises. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's not just the people who need credit that do it. It's, you know, our portfolio is very healthy in terms of FICO scores and the kind of people mm -hmm. that are making the decision. And it seems like in many cases get a premium product in terms of like getting variable speed and two stage yeah. and IQ and just kind of loading it up. S sometimes we overlook this. And even in that, when I gave you those three points, the net re result of that is the homeowner has a great customer experience. Yeah. Right. They, you come in, the typical contractor comes in to do a maintenance agreement and they hope they find something they can charge them to repair. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of their income model. Well, they're getting paid regularly for doing this. So when they go out there, if they do find something, they repair it, but it's no additional cost. So yeah. that trepidation you always feel about calling a contractor into your house, it can easily go away. Right. Because you know, when they come out, they're going to take care of it you're not going to pay anything extra. Right. So that, you know, I, I think that will grow this ultimately as more and more people experience it and talk to their neighbors about it. You know, that'll, that'll get that part of it. That'll keep that part of it growing and, and being accepted, you know, pretty quickly. Do you work with reliable in Atlanta? No, I don't. They're, they're okay. actually owned by a, a Canadian company as I understand it. Yeah. But yeah, that's some history. And one of the stories that we tell people um, there's a couple of big contractors in Atlanta that are doing this in a big way. Yeah. Re would you say Reliable is one of the most prominent in the country with this model? I, I, clearly the most, yeah. The most, okay, it, yeah. Th they've actually been quoted in, in newspaper articles, so this is not like insider information. Sure. Yeah. They've got over 30,000 30, homes on their leasing model. Dude, now, those 30,000 homes are off the market, right? Yeah. Throw in 
the other portfolio company with this product, they've probably got, after they've been doing it since 2017, they've probably got another 10 or 12, 15,000. In Atlanta, there's probably 40, 45,000 homes that aren't open for marketing. And, you know, and then it, we're seeing that. And that's kind of when you, the second part of this question is, um, you know, how are contractors accepting it? Well, they're starting to see it as they run into it more from a competitive standpoint. Mm-hmm. The Houston market now has several really large accounts, and we've we've had some inbound calls from people in that market. Um, there's some some other places. Um, you know, Buffalo's got a few people. It's like we could we could pull out some pockets, um, and so those places are becoming more aware of it, and we share it. It's a great opportunity if nobody's doing it in your market to be the one that everybody's talking about five years from now when you've locked down you know a big part of your customers in your community. Um, you don't want to be the one chasing and trying to find the customers that they're not doing, that they haven't locked down. Absolutely. Yeah. I always go back to this, um, this point from the American home comfort study. And by this point, I think this, this report's two years old and the data was pretty similar from the, the two years before that, but that the yeah. majority of homeowners who make a major purchase cannot even tell you the name of the company that did the work. And I run into it in my neighborhood. I run into it oh, yeah. everywhere around people, stutter on who actually did the work for their house, whether it was a compressor change out or an install, it takes them a moment and it does. Um, people got to take that seriously. I mean, that's a, but it's a big deal. I will tell you this, when you have somebody come in and, and put new air conditioning in and fix all the things that were wrong with the original new construction install, you will remember, I can tell you the guys that have done my work is Texas ACE. Oh yeah. Sean is the comfort advisor. I can also tell you that about six of my friends and my family have all had work done by Texas Ace because (laughs) they come in and diagnose the house. Right. Tell you, okay, we can put in this system, but you've got, you know, airflow problems. You've got return problems. What when you get somebody like that, and that's a piece of what this is, when you're gonna go in and put in a worry free system, you're gonna make sure as a contractor that system's gonna operate and you're not gonna have duct related issues on the equipment. So you're going to make those kind of repairs up front as well. Yeah. And your homeowner is just going to have a great experience. You may not be able to answer this question. That's completely okay. But how invested are the manufacturers in this concept or how interested are they? It, it's, um, they're interested and, yeah. and they know it's coming. We've, you know, we've pretty much talked to all of them. We're involved, you know, in some way with a couple, um, one of the big three that's out there, I mean, they told us about a year ago in conversation that, you know, they could see down the road where, um, you know, this was probably going to be 30, 40% of the market, mm-hmm. you know, and they would need to be involved as, as, as near as five years from now. Right. And so, and, and they've been out there testing a program. Um, you know, we've tried to convince them to, you know, let us test ours with them. And, you know, we're still in communication with them, but, sure. I, you know, I think, Everybody has tried something, yep. right? Whether they did something internal or whether they brought somebody in. Um, and there's two or three that are still out there with, you know, with kind of with pilot programs. So I, I think they know it's there. I don't think, um, I, th- I think they've accepted that it's not going to go away. Yeah. Uh, they're still trying to figure it out a little bit. Now, no, we haven't even talked about this piece, but think about all of the money that's coming into the market through you know, the government programs yep. on, you know, you know, tr- electrification and, and, uh, it, you know, just everything there. When you start to put some of those programs in place and you plug in some of that rebate money or down payment money and reduce some of these monthly costs down dramatically, um, you know, there's the potential for this to get even more traction than traditional financing. Hmm. Um, you know, we're certainly working with those folks. In fact, we, um, went and hired, uh, the uh, energy efficiency and government programs, utility programs, gentleman that I hired over at Lennox, Michael Flat, to join us back in January. Nice. Um, and, and, you know, working with NYSERDA, we're certified now with them on a program that allows us to offer uh, a, to a lower FICO score, allows us a, a little bit of a price discount in that market because of the way that we're able to uh, protect ourselves with their program. And the reach that it gives them, there's a couple of things that we're working on with California as well. Uh, but almost every state is working on some type of green bank initiative or something to 
support efforts in that area. And, and we really fit, our model fits that, um, you know, so well when you start to take those numbers down, it becomes, you know, you put in a very expensive system. And if you've got a, a eight or $9,000 upfront rebate, that monthly payment is, is, is pretty affordable. So here's a rabbit hole that I can't resist. If the contractor is selling the lease and the homeowner is paying for lease, who owns the equipment? So Service First owns the equipment. We have the agreement that is signed is between us and the homeowner. And then we have another agreement between the contractor and us that says the contractor is going to work on that equipment. And the homeowner lease says the contractor is is responsible for that equipment. So we don't have, you know, we're, we don't have any channel conflict. We're, we don't own any businesses. We don't have any trucks. We don't do their, we're in it to make them successful. Yeah. Uh, but legally we do own the equipment. Um, and that's why we can do some of these difficult to manage states on, you know, extended warranties and service agreements. Um, we have an agreement with the contractor to service the equipment. So right. it's not a homeowner extended warranty. It's, you know, so the, the legalities that you can get around because you have a lease and you're built it a certain way. Uh, it, make it something that we were able to do in any any state. I'm sorry that I'm making you explain things that you probably explain multiple times a day. <laughs> so that, there's so many people that are li- going to listen to this that yeah. uh, haven't haven't heard any of this. So that's that's not a problem. So here's the rabbit hole I want to go down. Then would the incentives from the federal level or the state level technically be due to Service First versus the homeowner? And does that oh, yeah. get tricky? No. So good question. Any kind of rebates that are out there, whether it's a utility rebate, a, a manufacturer rebate, or, um, or or the federal government, all of those go directly to the homeowner. Good. We, Good. we don't collect any of those. So uh, can you share some success stories of people who have been using you and what it looks like? And feel free to share their names. I can always edit them out too, but um, I'd love to love to know who's who's having success. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I I can share a few. I mean, our, our longest term customer um, is uh, FH Fur um, oh, yeah. out on out in Virginia. And are they still you know, private, we, privately held? No, and- they're not. They they recently sold the business, but uh, because of the success they were having and the average ticket and the yep. attachment rates and all of those things that I mentioned, the company that is there, you know, we purchased them, said, "Hey, go do this. We want you to go from." you know, whatever that revenue number of maybe 200 million, we want you to grow this much larger than that. And they've been out buying contractors and we have gone in and trained the, trained the sales groups for each one of those new contractors. So FH Fur has done uh, really nice. Um, and, and they were, you know, the, to be fair, uh, they're course, close to our corporate office. So they probably received some extra attention. But part of that was they helped us to pilot a lot of things when we found solutions for issues that we had um, you know, with other contractors, we would typically, you know, go over there and get a very good reading from them. So they've got some sales guys that are, are hugely successful with it and, yeah. and regularly originating. Um, we just recently bought, brought on a couple of, uh, an ARS and an ARS blue dot, um, yeah. contractors. They both had, um, you know, managers with experience, you know, from the program in prior places, they've taken off like crazy. There's a great, um, little company in Des Moines called golden rule. Yep. Um, and they're doing very well with it. Um, what's interesting as, as these different companies have been brought on is that they usually have a little bit of a instant success mm-hmm. and then they kind of have a little soft spot where, you know, it slows down a little bit and then they sort of re-engage with us and say, you know, Hey, help us. We're not, and you know, we're available and providing coaching and help all along the way, but it's kind of that second look that may be two or three months down the road where you sit down and say, okay, you know, so these were the things that were kind of missing. It was maybe the yeah. commitment level, or it was maybe, you know, the, you know, how often you talk to your people about it. There's something typically very obvious that they're not doing that we tried to coach them to do up front. Um, but, you know, these guys are all successful business owners and they're used to this kind of stuff. And right. They know that they can be successful until they can't. Right. And so I, I think that, you know, if if I were to talk about what what's the biggest strength of our company, it's you know it's it's our execution and coaching team, you know, account management. So, you know, we let them know up front very specifically and directly what it's going to take mm-hmm. to be successful. We have kind of what we call it a success playbook, 
And we'll go through that and say, look, we're not telling you you have to do these things. We're telling you our successful contractors are doing some of these things, and we'll point out what's, which ones are important. And if you follow this playbook, you can avoid you know, kind of the painful learning curve that other people have. Um, and so those that follow it fairly closely usually, you know, take off in a pattern and others, you know, we have to kind of come back and, and, you know, reintroduce some of those things and have con- conversations. Um, but, you know, we've got uh, a great um, senior VP and head of training, John Carmen, used to have his, he started in the industry as a comfort advisor, had his own company. Um, he worked for a lot of the different OEMs. So a lot of people know him. Um, yeah did some work w- with Lennox. You may have met him there. Um, and then he, uh, Service Experts hired him as a full-time person. He was at Service Experts when they brought the program down from Canada. Mm-hmm. And so he was a part of the team that basically took this Canadian program and, you know, U.S. A- adopted it for the U.S. and made it yeah. hugely successful. And then came over to join our team at the beginning uh, to, to help us do the same thing. And then we've got a couple of uh, comfort advisors, former comfort advisors that are coaches, they were selling at 70, 80 percent of on the leasing model as comfort advisors before they joined us. And so they go in and they assist with the training, but they hang around afterward for a couple of days or a week, and they'll do ride-alongs, role plays, right. uh, coaching, whatever the the contractor is comfortable allowing us to do. Yep. And then typically part of the lull, you know, we let them do it, we help them, we show them, we coach them. And then you leave and, you know, over the weekend, you forget all that stuff. And so <laughs> three weeks later, we go back, yep. we do another round of it. You know, we try to get on their their weekly or biweekly sales call, you know, to, to help them with those things. And so those, and then, you know, the account, the, the lead on the account, um, you know, actually our CEO is involved in this process as we kind of, you know, get, this is the biggest thing to be able to scale the company is to be able to do this well. And so he's involved, but, you know, then we, you know, regular check-ins with the ownership or the, the champion of the program to, you know, how's it going? What can we do to help, you know, help them reposition, um, you know, put something in place, come back out, do some more training, a lot of turnover in this industry. So you have to keep sure. doing that. But I think that's the big difference um, that we provide in the marketplace is a very hands-on. We only do training on site. Um, oh, interesting. You know, training yeah. is very difficult to be successful at. Mm-hmm. Um, so that team is, you know, we do our weekly calls and we always have, you know, praise and accolades at the end. And they're, uh, they're, they're always uh, winning the day because they do a great job for the customer. I'm sure. Man, I remember, you know, three years ago when we first started talking about this, you had just started, you kind of had a spreadsheet and a list of contacts and a really good idea that worked really well in another country. And now you've got yeah. like people all over the country. So talk to me about, what you've built over the last few years and what the staffing looks like, what's your, what's yeah. your bench look like? It, you know, what's interesting is uh, it, there's a parallel here to when I became a territory manager at Lenox. Mm-hmm. You know, I showed up in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I got a company car that had a, a trunk full of engineering handbooks that hadn't been updated in a year and a, a, literally a spreadsheet that had my 10 or 12 accounts yeah. and my quota. That's everything I had. There was no thing as a CRM back in, you know, early nineties. And, um, so, you know, it was a little bit similar with very early days with this company. It's not, you know, so I had a spreadsheet with like, I think there were 63 accounts on there. You know, fortunately I had a few contacts from that I brought in, but we, you know, we, we added, uh, we brought HubSpot in. Um, we've had some folks involved there. So, you know, I think there's over 20,000 contacts in there now. Um, you know, we've been growing it organically. We haven't gone out and bought lips and lists and dumped them in. We kind of, you know, strategically have gone from market to market or maybe with a big given OEM or wh- whatever that's been. So that now, you know, almost any kind of contact that comes in, I can pull up the company and have some information in front of me as I'm talking to them. You know, with a startup company, we've gone through, you know, a, a, a pretty good number of, you know, of regional sales reps. And it's just, it's a, it's a different kind of animal for a salesman to come in who's getting paid on commission Mm -hmm. to be in a startup where there's not this established, you know, kind of clientele that they're getting paid on while they try to grow and develop, you know, to win really big. And so the guys that have been very systematic, very predictable in their approach, they're out Mm -hmm. there, you know, just regularly 
working that funnel, regularly reaching out, you know, have kind of started to grow and, and be very successful. Um, you know, right now we've got, you know, kind of three full-time salespeople. We're actually looking at, looking for two more people right at this time. Mm-hmm. I get on a call. If we get busy, you know, um, our CEO get on a call. You know, it's it's kind of the small or the the startup. I wouldn't say small. The startup company. Um, you know, we've got internal IT now. We're about to launch our 2.0 uh, digital platform, which we've been testing it for now for a little over a month with some big, really big dealers, and it's 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 doing really well. So, but we've we've got those resources. Our customer support team is all in uh, the 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 Bethesda or DC area. Um, in fact, we're just moving from one facility a couple blocks away into a, a, a little bigger facility. Um, as we speak, I think everybody in, in that area is, is working remote for another eight or 10 days until the other, um, the other building is ready for us. Um, but, you know, the field group and the, um, the trainers are all out, you know, out in the marketplace. We've got, uh, you know, a couple people here in Dallas. We've got uh, a trainer in Austin, um, Atlanta, Tampa, uh, got some representation up in chicago boston out in uh portland so Um, so you're all in we're looking for you know we're looking for some focused area in some of the other you know big southern states and uh um you know it's it's a it's a little different model for the kind of people we look for for the for the sales but um you know we're, we're making some really good progress there um and i think right now we're also looking for a couple of additional coaches and trainers as we uh as we start to kind of roll in and have some, some nice success with uh, some companies that have brought us two or three of their companies, but they have a lot more that are a part of their organization that ultimately once they start to see great results, you're going to want to bring more people on. No doubt. Well, I have two final questions. Uh, we're getting, you know, coming up on 50 minutes here. As long as I've known you, you've always been the person working on the new thing and the hard thing. Yeah. I don't know if that is a good description, but I mean, going back to like when I met you 2008, like, you know, the company was operating in a certain way and then they were going to do a bunch of new and hard stuff and Tom was going to lead that. And you've been doing the new and hard thing. How do you stay organized and how do you stay effective and how do you not get overwhelmed and how do you just, you know, push a boulder up a hill for yeah. the better half of a decade? Well, you, as you know, I'm a little bit of a workaholic, mm-hmm. um, but I, I, you know, I had a conversation with another um, a guy at a marketing company that I met not too long ago, and we he was asking me some of these kind of questions because he was just starting to focus completely on the HVAC, and he said, you know, ask me a similar type of question. I said, you know, even when I was a district manager, um, I I really loved creating something new, taking it to the market, and you know, making changes that are still there today. There's a whole yeah. lot of stuff they're doing at Lennox that has my name on it. People oh, yeah. may not know it. Yep. They may be working on spreadsheets that if they go back and see the source, it may be even original spreadsheet from seven or eight years ago. Um, I, you know, I, I, that's, I, I think that's how I'm wired. I mean, I, you know, when I interviewed for this job, that's one of the things I told the news, I said, this is going to be completely different for me going from a, a large corporate structure. I mean, you and I both did this yep. and going into a, you know, kind of a fast moving startup at the time we had seven employees and, you know, certainly now we're, we're much bigger than that, but still compared to Lennox. Um, but I, you know, I just, it, you know, that's kind of where I get my joy and fun out of this is, you know, when, when people start talking about what we did, when you look at this two or three years from now, if the marketplace has moved 35, 40% to leasing, you know that we're going to be part of the engine a big part of the engine that was behind that right right getting out to the independent contractors working with different distributors and different OEMs and so that that's what drives me um how do i stay organized <laughs> sometimes i feel like i don't but i will tell you i have um a a, a to do document that you know i pretty much update every day mm-hmm. um you know, I move things around every once in a while. Stuff gets missed or deleted, but um, you know, I, I try to stay focused on that. I use HubSpot for some of the task reminders. Um, I just I'm not always in there as much, yeah. and so my you know, I, it's kind of the same to do list that I used when I was at Linux. Yeah, you know, managing all the different things over there. 
Um, that's probably the biggest thing I do. And then every once in a while, my boss is really good at this. It, you know, it's it's going back and looking at that big list and saying, okay, you you know, the story of the big rocks. What are the big rocks I need to put in first? Yeah. And and usually, you know, everything kind of falls out. Every once in a while, you get down the road and you think, oh, man, we really should have done this a while back. Um, you were probably doing something more important at the time. Right. Yeah. So that's, I think, you know, the frustration. I mean, there are days when, yeah, it, you know, I just, uh, I have to go downstairs and, you know, it's different now. I, I love, the, love the fact that I don't have to commute, even though I was close to the office. Um, I just got to go downstairs and turn everything off and, you know, just go for a walk or yeah. watch something stupid on TV or, or, and then, you know, I, you know, oftentimes come back in the evening because, you know, some clarity or some idea came up. Um, yeah. That's kind of it. Long answer, yeah. I guess. No, no, it's helpful. I'm, I'm going through the process right now of understanding energy management and time management because some days I run out of energy, some days I run out of time and I'm finding, um, and you know, this is taking a little bit of work with my wife, but I get a surge of energy around nine o'clock at night that if I can just like look at the big rocks at nine o'clock till nine 30 and get organized, it, it buys me a bunch of energy the next day. And anyways, I'm just always, um, I, what you are trying to do there, um, requires a lot of strategic focus and grit. And so I have a lot of respect for that. And it all, it all it seems like everything you've done always has. So it's, yeah, I, you know, when I was, you know, looking at joining this group and it's like, you know, why and what do I want to do? It was that, it, that easily came up. I could name all kinds of, of things that we did at Linux. The stuff that I remember are the things that nobody was doing. We did them. And then yep. a couple of years later, the companies found it and it's like, oh, this is great. Let's do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's, that's where I get my, my joy and my reward. You talk about coming up late at night. Yeah. I, you know, I'll do that too, but Unfortunately, I don't do it from nine to nine thirty. I do it from nine to one. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, I six seven hours sleep, I'm good. Yeah, and so uh, you know, it works for me now. I'm, you know, I tried to not do quite as much when the kids were younger. Uh, I do see my children with my work ethic, and sometimes I apologize. <laughs> well, final two questions. This one is not work related at all. You just made me think of this. Uh, are you binging any TV right now? Is anything uh, anything good on TV that uh, you like to de-stress with? You know, um, I, I read a lot. I mean, yeah. it, because of the the stuff that I did at Lennox, I traveled so much over the years. You know, my Kindle's probably got, you know, 750 books in it. Yeah. Um, and I love all the, you know, the the military stuff, the murder mysteries, the legal stuff. So every time that... You know, Netflix or Amazon or somebody comes out with a new series that's tied to the book, like, you know, like Reacher or uh, those kind of things are typically the ones that I pick up. Um, I, you know, I, I like the cop shows. I like anything that, you know, the the the, the guy, the pe people that do math, you know, to solve problems and the <laughs> person with the perfect memory, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, I have to confess to being a Hallmark movie fan. Oh, okay. I can edit and, that out or we can keep it in there. It's completely. Yeah. You, you can leave it. You can leave it. I'm also one that, you know, <laughs> you know, at Christmas time, especially cries at most of them. But I tell you, my wife and I really enjoy, um, you know, the America's got talent yeah, that's and, a good one. you know, the singing shows, um, you know, watching people and, and wondering why we didn't get that ta blessed with that talent. Um, yeah, it's not fair. But, you know, those are pretty fun. Good, good. All right. Well, final question. Um, I'm sure you talked to a lot of contractors and there's a lot of contractors listening to this, hopefully in season two of Change Your Filter. Um, what is your ideal contractor look like and how would they go about making contact with you? Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we usually talk about this in terms of, you know, kind of that entry level contractor. What's the, the sort of the minimum volume minimum size, minimum amount of leadership that they have inside the group. Um, and, and so that I would differentiate that from, you know, from an ideal contractor. I, I think an ideal contractor, you know, is is doing 10 to $15 million in total sales and, you know, 50% of that at residential replacement. Um, they've got three or more comfort advisors that are full-time salespeople. And they've got somebody who's a sales manager 
you know, who's had experience at it. He may do a couple other roles, but, but he, you know, that per, he or she is definitely the person that's tasked with managing those people and holding them accountable. Um, those are big and important. And then the leadership, you know, has to buy in. Mm -hmm. And we tell them, you know, when we go through the, you know, kind of the pre-training calls, if you get off one of these calls and you're really not bought into the fact that this is the best sale you could make for your business, we're okay if you call us and say, we're not going to do this right now. Yeah. Because yeah. we don't want to waste your time. We don't want to waste our time. Yeah. Now, from a entry level, what we are, are looking for is somebody who's doing $3 million in residential replacement. That usually means they'll have one or two comfort advisors. Usually when they're at that level, they've got two or three mid-level managers. What we've experienced and, and what we've failed at is trying to onboard, uh, you know, kind of that eight or nine person business where the owner is wearing all the hats sure. and they're all excited about the program. And when we, when we leave, something else important happens and we are lost. Yep. So that's kind of the, the real differentiator is, do they have a support structure of a little bit of mid-level management that can, can continue to f hold focus on the program and hold their teams accountable? And then if they do, man, let's go. Awesome. So if you are listening to this and that is you or you aspire to be like that type of company, how do they reach out to you, Tom? So they can find us um, there I I everywhere on our website, which is servicefirstfinancial.com, or you can yep. go to worryfreehomecomfort.com. It'll get us there. Um, you scroll down and there's a place to schedule an appointment with us. Um, you can certainly reach me. Uh, directly, I get on calls regularly. If I'm too busy, if I've got, I'll get one of our regional people on it uh, at thomas.tow, T O W E, at service first. That's with one S T, financial.com. And uh, I don't have an, well, I have, a, I have a, a VoIP phone on my computer, but the number I give out is, you know, is 469 585 4541. That's my cell. Don't worry if you didn't write it down. If you go look at me on LinkedIn, you will see my, correct phone number, my correct email address, and my home personal email. Uh, so, you know, I'm in sales. You can find me, um, but we're happy to to jump on a call. We'll set something up for, you know, even if it's just to, to learn a little bit more, we'll send you some information. Perfect. Well, thank you for joining the Change Your Filter podcast. Thank you. I appreciate the time, Paul. Thank you for listening to the Change Your Filter podcast. I hope this podcast today was valuable for you. If you liked this podcast, please go to wherever you listen to podcasts and write a review. And if you have an idea of a guest or a topic, leave it in the notes of our YouTube feed. If you are interested in learning more about Contractor Commerce, go to contractorcommerce.com, click learn more, and my team will hook you up.